Um, I'll do a, a quick introduction for those people that, that don't know me. Um, I worked, I actually worked with Laura for quite a few years. I was, uh, we were at the Advocacy Center and then Starbridge together. Um, I have been working in the field for 35 years and focusing on uh, mostly on Tourette syndrome, but also on difficult behaviors. Um, my, I have three kids and two of them do have Tourette. They are um, both adults now. Um, and if I, if I slip, because I, I now work for the Tourette Association of America and do a lot of presentations, and if I, if I slip and say Tourette, um, forgive me, and just, uh, it, it really is applicable to any and all um, difficulties and, and disinhibitions. So um, I'll try, uh, <laughs> try not to do that. Um, and please ask questions, because disinhibition um is really critically important and i i know there'll be i know there'll be questions um i've been for the last uh well again i've been doing this for 35 years and um i find disinhibition to be probably the the most important of all the symptoms of uh um, people that have neurological disorders um if we can understand disinhibition we can understand better challenging behaviors. And if we can understand the challenging behaviors, we can much better um, provide for the, uh, for the person. Um, if you're not familiar with Ross Green and you either have a child or work with a child with challenging behaviors, I would strongly encourage you to um, go to his website. He has books, he has videos, he um, is wonderful. And it's really this quote that has uh, served me so many, for so many years. It's your explanation of the behavior that leads directly to how you respond to it. So with my, with my son, who was very, um, very severely impacted with Tourette, my, my daughter was more mildly impacted and my middle son doesn't have Tourette. Um, but along with the, the Tourette were all sorts of uh, comorbid and co-occurring disorders. And so if my son said something to me or did something that was very inappropriate, um, and my explanation was that he did it on purpose, then my response would be to punish him. But if I, if I have an understanding of disinhibition, if I have an understanding of, of the uh, disorder, um, then um, my explanation is more likely to be, this is, this is part of his disorder, this is a symptom, and I'm going to handle it totally differently. Um, punishment um, really does not work for people with neurological disorders if, um, because it's neurological. Uh, punishment and reactive um, can help people um, that can manage their behaviors, but for neurological disorders and uh, for people that have the disinhibition, um, it, it really is not very helpful. And the reason it's not is because um, it's the basal ganglia in our brain that um, chooses which actions to perform at the moment. So whether it's behaviors, whether it's statements, um, emotions, um, you know, whatever the person may be doing, um, they may want to inhibit it. But the basal ganglia is the part of the brain that says, hmm, yeah, we probably shouldn't do this or yeah, it's okay to do that. So a lot of people uh, refer to um, the disinhibition as having leaky brakes. Uh, sometimes the brakes will work and sometimes they won't work. And I think this makes it more difficult for people to understand um, if, if it was consistent that every time they went to close a door, they slammed it. Um, it would be easier for us to understand that, okay, they do that every time, that must be part of their disorder. But if they only slam the door once in a while, then is it because, you know, they're doing it on purpose or is it um, because they have a strong urge um, to slam the door? So it's the basal ganglia. And my son is now 38, so I've been doing research on, on neurological um, neurological difficulties for the last uh, 35 years. And even back in 1990, they knew that uh, the basal ganglia was impacted um, by neurological disorders um, and Tourette syndrome. So 
Um, we don't know a whole lot about the brain, but we're learning and uh, it, it's important um, for you all to, to recognize that um, if a person is doing something, it may be due to the basal ganglia not working um, properly in that moment. So I looked up, there's a, a medical definition of disinhibition um, and actions which seem to be tactless, yes, rude, yes, often, or even offensive. They occur when people don't follow the usual social rules about what or where to say or do something. Disinhibited behaviors can place enormous strain on families and care providers, and I would add um, on the person who has the symptoms. Um, you know, as a family person, yeah, um, it was it was very difficult for our family. Um, and with with neurological things, you know, we the normal um, approaches to behaviors and to raising a child. Um, don't necessarily work for a kid that has the um, the neurological and and the and the disinhibition uh, punishment's not going to work and that's what you know we as parents that's what we were brought on that's what we um, knew that uh, would help but um, so it, it it puts a tremendous strain on families and on care providers uh, educators who really want to help these kids um, but you know just don't understand what's going on. So uh, Rose Woods wrote a book uh, quite a while ago, and, and, I, and I have referred to her uh, um, this quote quite frequently. Uh, disinhibition, and the name of the book is Disinhibition Syndrome, and she uses why um, instead of I in the disinhibition because um, she um, believes that that uh, represents that it's medical uh, rather than just something on purpose. Um, so it's a condition in people with primary neurological disorders that limit a person's ability to use his inhibitory process and learned inhibitory skills. This is another thing that we, we kind of do wrong. We, we see a kid doing something and so we will spend time with them, um, counseling them on um, what to do differently or you know, trying to teach them what's right from wrong. The kids mostly, the people, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I will say kids, but I do, do see that there's a lot of uh, adults as well. Um, people with disinhibition, um, they, they typically know right from wrong. It's just that in the moment, they aren't able to, um, uh, they aren't able to do what they know they should be doing. Um, and, and, and lots of times they feel guilty. Lots of times they, uh, they will apologize. Um, so the individual may experience movements, behaviors, swearing, inappropriate comments, emotional outbursts, rage, infantile noises, or behaviors, noises, faces, laughter, uh, which can be contextual or non-contextual. Um, this is important too, because as I've as I've worked with um, people over the years, a lot of times they will say, "Well, I, I know it isn't the um, I know it isn't the Tourette because it was in context." Um, it can be in context. Um, so if uh, there's um, uh, there's a movie playing and it's about elephants, um, the person may something may, may say something offensive about elephants. Um, it can be contextual. Unfortunately, the world sees the disinhibition more only from non-contextual especially uh, for people that do have Tourette's and, and the, the swearing part of it. But uh, just understand that it can be contextual or it can be uh, non-contextual. So I get asked this a lot too. So what's the difference between disinhibition and impulsivity? Um, impulsivity is responding quickly before you think. So by the, it's kind of the Dennis the Menace thing. By the time I thought about whether I should or I shouldn't, I already did. Um, vastly different from disinhibition because disinhibition again is the inability to consistently inhibit behaviors, emotions, movements, which are known to be inappropriate and the person does not want to do. Um, so the person again knows right from wrong but can't inhibit in the moment. And that's a, such a key phrase, I'll probably say it over and over. Um, it's in the moment. And lots of times people will apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. 
Um, so if my if my son is swearing at me, um, you know, he may apologize right away or he may apologize later um, after his uh, brain chemistry has gotten into a better place. Um, but almost always uh, the, the person um, doesn't feel good about um, doing what they know is wrong, which makes sense. Um, but a lot of times I'll um, be in a meeting and they'll say, well, I know it wasn't uh, part of the disinhibition um, because uh, you know they did it so quickly. Um, disinhibition, it's sort of like getting, they may need to get the last hurt or the last touch. So it, it can, I, I knew one boy that um, he was in lunch and his neighbor uh, spilled milk in his food. And it took, they didn't see each other the rest of the day. And so the next day they were in lunch again and, and the kid that had the disinhibition spit in, in the other kid's food. It took him 24 hours, but he was able to, to get that last um, touch, that last hurt, um, that last bad thing. Um, it was on his brain, thinking about it all the time, um, and he just had to do it in order for the brain to stop thinking about it. So um, lots of times people that have disinhibition uh, will say things uh, when confronted. Um, so a person may say, why do you keep doing that when I've told you over and over and over not to do that? And the person may say, I don't know, my brain makes me do it. Uh, it's like a voice in my head that keeps telling me to do it. Um, and, and that one is particularly, uh, I have found um, difficult because, um, you know, these little kids, they're, they're not going to say, um, and, and even as adults, they may not know, well, you know, my dopamine and the serotonin were kind of out of balance. And so, you know, I just had to say that, I had to do that, I had to touch that. Um, and if they tell an adult it's 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 a voice in their head, then too many times I've been um, I've seen where people think they have schizophrenia. It's just a it's just an explanation. The kids don't know, and they do know that an adult wants an explanation. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes they'll they'll give an explanation that um, you know I think it's funny, so that's why I did it. Um, not because that's the truth necessarily but because they know the adult wants to hear something. And lots of times people would rather um, appear to be bad than to be weird. So if a person is doing something that they know is really inappropriate and somebody asks them, you know, why did you do that? Um, to say, well, you know, I don't know. It's just something that I had to do. It was in my head. Uh, they can be weird. So too often people would rather appear to be bad than to be weird. There's a, there's a club for um, bad, um, not much of a club for weird. So what typically is not helpful for disinhibition? Giving suggestions, reminders, and punishments um, don't work. Um, disinhibition is suggestible. So um, I, I, the, the biggest one I could think of is, you know, if you're standing talking to someone in a park or something and, and you see their eyes looking over your shoulder and they say, oh my God, uh, oh, wait, wait, don't look now. You're going to really want to look <laughs> because, um, you know, it, it, it's the suggestion. You're, you're going to have a strong urge to look. Um, there was a teacher I was working with and she called me one time and, and she said, you know, that he has to touch the fire alarm every time he's in the hallway. And um, she said, but I think I have an answer. So every time we're going to go in the hallway, I'm going to tell him, now remember, don't touch the fire alarm. She now has planted it in his brain. And by suggesting it, she has made it more difficult for him to inhibit it. Uh, some people use the, um, you know, the green, yellow, red light uh, behavior management. I don't find that really works well. Again, I think that works well for people that can control what they're doing. Um, I think for people that have neurological disorders, it just increases their anxiety. Okay, I'm in the green, that's cool. Uh-oh, now I'm in the yellow. And if you throw in some obsessive thinking 
that is going to increase anxiety. And almost always for people with neurological disorders, anxiety is going to increase symptoms. Um, so it doesn't work. And, and you know, sending a kid to a timeout room, um, it, it just doesn't work because again, you know, they, they don't have control over it necessarily. Um, so I used to have a slide and I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. It was, it was with Linus and he was playing with a basketball and he was shooting the basketball up in the basket and it, he, the ball just kept on missing the basket, missing the basket. And so he carried the ball into the house, put the ball into the closet, closed the door and said, you can come out when you learn to behave. You know, that's, that's kind of what we do to some kids that have neurological disorders. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we wouldn't take a, a person that has uh, seizures and send them to time out. Um, kids with neuro people, excuse me, people with neurological disorders are very, 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 very complex. Um, but punishing them typically doesn't work. Um, you know, it, it's like, you know, if someone reminds you not to scratch an itch or to blink. And I was in the dentist's office last week and, and they asked me to hold my tongue still. <laughs> Try that when somebody suggests to, to do that. So reminders and suggestions uh, don't necessarily work. So how can we help? Um, first of all, don't take behaviors personally. Um, again, Ross Green, um, it's your explanation of the behavior that leads directly to how you respond to it. And if you take the behavior personally, you're gonna get angry. Um, and you're, you're not going to uh, be in a place where you can really uh, look at the behavior and, and see if there's something, some way that you can help. Um, avoid making assumptions. I, I see this a lot too, because I, I think we all, all of us want simple answers. Um, so he's smart, he knows what he's doing. Um, she is purposely being sarcastic, rude, and inconsiderate. Um, he's just being lazy, and the one I, really hate and hear most is they're doing it for attention. People with neurological disorders usually get more attention than they really want. Um, so, you know, there, there was a kid I was working with, he was in eighth grade and um, every once in a while he had to get down on the floor and bark like a dog. And that, you know, everybody thought he was doing it to get attention and I said, gee, you know, I've never seen an eighth grade boy try to get the attention of eighth grade girls by barking like a dog. Um, it, it, it's just, it's too easy of an explanation. Uh, we need to be curious. Um, is the response typical of the kid's behavior? Lots of times I'll, I'll hear that, you know, I, I just don't understand why he's doing it because he's a really smart kid and he's, you know, he's polite and a nice person, but every once in a while he'll say something very rude to me. Um, if it's not typical of the personality, then again, you wanna look at it as being uh, disinhibition. Is the person hungry or tired or anxious or afraid? Um, any kind of stress to the body is going to increase symptoms. Um, so Ross Green says, if the person is hungry or thirsty, give them something to drink or eat because um, being hungry and thirsty is stressful uh, for the body and can increase um, symptoms. Um, being tired, anxious, afraid, all of those can, can increase the disinhibition. Um, is it due to a skills deficit? Are they so frustrated because they, you know, they, they can't do what they know they need to do? Um, is it a skills deficit? Is it, is it writing? Is their handwriting terrible? And you know, we, we tell them to, to, to write over and over again. Um, is, is there some kind of other skills deficit? Is it a, is it a social skills deficit that uh, you know, they really need to learn um, some um, way to manage their anxiety in social settings? Um, have we attempted to ask the person uh, why it occurs? I mean, nine times out of 10, they're not gonna know. And again, you know, we don't, we don't wanna push that a lot. Um, but there was, there, was a, there was a kid, we, we need to involve the person in, in um, so any kind of strategies that we develop. Uh, there was a boy that um, I was working with, he was in first grade and um, in Tourette, 
there's a symptom called copopraxia, and it's uh, excessive middle finger activity. And I, you know, I find it a little funny that there's a scientific name for flipping somebody off. But at any rate, this uh, this kid had the copopraxia, and so the teacher uh, kept him after school and said, "I, you know, I know you're getting beat up. I know you don't want to do this." It's getting you in trouble. Can you can you think of any way that I can help you? And he came in the next day with a pocket full of poker chips, and he said, "You know, I thought about it, and I think if every time I have the urge to do my finger, I'll take a poker chip out of my pocket and put it on, um, walk up to your desk and put it in a cup. I think that will help. Never in a zillion years would I have come up with that strategy. So thinking outside the box to help help the people too." And speak with a person, like I said, to determine if there are strategies that might be helpful. So it's important that, that you guys all understand disinhibition and the world understands dis disinhibition, but it, it's also really important that you have an understanding and you have a um, something that you're comfortable with in bringing awareness to others. Um, so these are just some examples. Uh, you're going to have to develop something. It, it needs to be brief, um, and it needs to, you know, bring some awareness. And you can you can tell when something's working. I mean, I've done enough presentations where I'll say something, and you can tell, you know, the the light goes on. Oh, okay, that was that was a good way for me to describe it because I, I see that you know they understand it. So neurological disorders almost always involve this inhibition. Um, person often knows right from wrong, but are sometimes in the moment, not able to inhibit emotions, anxiety, responses. Uh, and you can, you can bring up the, the basal ganglia thing if you're comfortable with that. Um, we all have an inconsistent ability to inhibit behavior, actions, and emotions that we know to be inappropriate and do not what to do and do not want to do. Um, the, it's the basal ganglia that um, when it's impacted, it increases this uh, inconsistency. Um, and it may look pur purposeful. It really, almost always it looks purposeful. Um, and, and it also may appear to be uh, related to an emotional disorder um, or due to poor parenting. Um, it really isn't. It's the neurological, it's the brain. Uh, you know, we're starting to know more and more about the brain, but we still have a lot to learn. So um, it, it really is the basal ganglia part of the brain that sort of is the, is the brake system. And sometimes the braking system works and other times you got the leaky brakes and it doesn't work. Or sometimes the brakes will get put on and um, they won't release. So then you get like an obsessive compulsive thing where you just have to keep doing it and doing it. So this in addition, um, frequently uh, is viewed as um, disrespect. Um, he curses, he swears at me. Uh, she, sell, she yells at me in public. She hits me. Um, the person says, I can't do my homework. You know, that's something that we need to look at. And if, if, a, ch if a person is saying that, um, is it they can't or they won't? And we make the assumption that they won't do it. When in reality, what we need to, to hear is they can't do it and why can't they do it and how can they be helped so that they can do it um, rather than they just refuse to do it and they won't do it. Um, he tells me to stop talking, to, to shut up. Um, my son used to do that with, with us a lot and it took me a long time, uh, first of all, not to take that personally, and to recognize it that he was communicating with me. Um, you know, he didn't really want to tell me to shut up, but he needed to communicate that he was overwhelmed. And so stop talking, shut up. Um, it took me a long time to be able to, to, to see that as him communicating rather than him being disrespectful. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're sorry. Uh, you can't talk to me that way. Um, I, I said to my husband one time, when we stop accepting his apologies, 
he's going to stop apologizing. So again, going back to it's our explanation of the behavior that leads directly to how we respond to it. Um, think of it as, you know, the, the person is a good person, doesn't want to do this. Um, it just, the, the braking system is, is faulty. Um, and we all have faulty brakes. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, if we have had a hard day or if we drink a lot of alcohol, um, our basal ganglia is impacted. And so a lot of us um, have moments of not being able to inhibit. I know I do. Um, we've been married 48 years. So, you know, ask my husband. <laughs> there are times. Um, and, and, you know, making suggestions doesn't, doesn't always work. Um, you know, he's big on telling me where to park. And when he does that, that, trust me, so last place I'm going to park. So accepting the apologies, um, understanding and, and letting the kid and the person know that, that you're trying to understand. Um, you know, again, I've been doing this for 35 years and, and I still have a hard time, you know, truly understanding it. Um, I think the big thing is that I, I don't take it personally. Um, I think that's one of the, the major, major components that we need to begin with. Um, because if we, can, if we can get past taking it personally, then we can really um, be more curious. Um, if we take it personally, we're just gonna get angry. Um, so it, it's hard, it's hard not to take it personally <laughs> uh, when somebody is being nasty to you and saying nasty things. Um, but if we can get there, it, it helps you, it reduces your anxiety, um, but it also helps the, the person. Um, try to view the person as having difficulties and not being difficult. Um, that also, it, it's our mindset. It's it's the view. It's the it's the it's the color of the glasses that we look out of. Um, you know, oh, he, this, here's this person that's always difficult, or here's this person that has some difficulties. Major difference in in how we're going to respond. Um, and again, let's say a million times, it's our explanation. Um, and be be comfortable. Figure out an explanation for disinhibition. Um, that helps you to inform others, um, because this is this is one of the um, uh, th th this is one of the neurological difficulties that that really 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 is highly misunderstood. And it um, so if we can if we can educate the world about disinhibition will have done a good thing. I, I coordinate a, um, a support group for parents of kids with rage and it, it's national. There was a, so there's a woman in California and she's also a mental health provider. And at our last meeting, she said, we can feel disrespected, but that doesn't mean the person is being disrespectful. Uh, I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> I um, I told her I was going to use it in my future presentation um, because we we feel disrespected, but that doesn't mean the person is being disrespectful. It it may mean that he's having a moment of disinhibition, um, but it doesn't mean that they're being disrespectful because we adults don't like being disrespected. Um, but if we can get past that. Like I said, it, um, it's helpful for everybody. So I hope you have a lot of questions because um, I know this is a complex uh, topic. And um, I, I, you know, whenever I do this, I, there's, there's questions. So don't feel embarrassed to ask the questions. Plus, Laura is the only one that's going to see them. So. Thanks so much, Kathy. Actually, we do have quite a few questions. Um, the first one, great question, is, um, oops, I'm sorry, uh, is um, who would confirm a diagnosis or disinhibition? Would it be confirmed by a doctor or by a psychologist? That is a good question. Um, to my 
Well, there is the medical definition. So um, a psychiatrist might, a neurologist might, if they're aware. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, the medical world, I have found, can't, isn't caught up with neurological disorders either. So um, I guess if I were a parent or if I were a provider and wanted and needed um, a diagnosis of disinhibition. I, you know, I would go to the I would I would go to the neurologist or the psychiatrist and see if they could give it to me. But um, it, it's really I'm not sure that you're going to get a diagnosis of it. Um, I would hope that you could, but it, it's really more of a of a symptom than it is a diagnosis. Okay, great. Thank you. This one. Um is um, their child uh, swears and when they get upset or frustrated and their in-laws get really upset. Um, they don't understand and they feel, um, and I heard you say this in your presentation, disrespectful. Do you have any ideas on how to help the son, how to maybe get them to stop doing that or change the behavior or even to how to help the in-laws understand? Yeah, this is a rather common dilemma. Um, you can try to educate um, the, the in-laws and talk to them about disinhibition, but sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't work. Um, if you want to help the child, you may have a plan. Um, again, being proactive rather than reactive. So talk to the, talk to the kid ahead of time and say, okay, you know, you know how, how grandma and grandpa are. And so if you start, if, if you start feeling your anxiety vase getting a little bit full and you can demonstrate, you can take a vase and start filling it up and, and, and show them physically that um, sometimes it only takes the last little thing for the vase to overflow and then he's going to start swearing. So if you can help him, I mean, I don't know how old he is, but if he's old enough so that he can start recognizing with when his anxiety increases and you have a plan. So here's the game. You can go in the other room and play with the game. Or, you know, they have a basketball basket, you can go outside and throw baskets. And, you know, if, if the, some, some in-laws, some relatives are, are really not um, willing to really listen to an explanation. And unfortunately they, they think that, um, on lots of times that uh, that what the kid needs to be is punished. Um, there's people I know that have stopped going to uh, their in-laws because it, it's so harmful for their child um, to be blamed all the time and, and to be punished and to, me, to be made to feel bad. So, you know, you can talk to the, talk to the in-laws as much as you possibly can, try to get them to understand and you know, if all else fails, say you know we're. I'm, I'm really sorry. This is this is this is horrible. But I can't keep putting him in a situation where he's made to feel like he's a bad person. So you know, we need to come up with some strategies on on how to deal with this better. Great, thank you, Kathy. The next question is: What about a child that is not remorseful? Yeah, that's hard. Um, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, if they're not remorseful, I, I guess I would try to talk with them when they're calm, um, and and let them feel safe to really talk about it. And it may take a long time, and it may take a therapist that that understands. Um, People, kids that aren't remorseful, um, it, it may be that they they were remorseful and it, it wasn't accepted. And so now they're just angry. Um, so, you know, if, if they're not remorseful, it, it, it may be their anger. It, it may be that they're so out of whack. It may be that their, their chemistry is so out of balance at that moment that they're not able to be remorseful. Um, give them opportunities to talk later. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're not, then I would wonder about some kind of underlying anger um, for, for why they're 
they're not willing to, to, to apologize or to even say, you know, I didn't mean it. They don't even have to apologize. They don't have to apologize because it's neurological, but they can say, you know, I, 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 oh, by the way, you know, I didn't mean that. I really love you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. The next question is, what is the best way to correct an inappropriate behavior or actions towards a younger sibling? Mm. Well, you guys are coming up with hard questions here. <laughs> um, that is a tough one. Um, so sometimes it's a it, it, it's not it's not unusual this is this is um this is a common question that we do get um unfortunately we we don't have a uh, a really good answer um except i i used to have to um just separate my kids and and again let the child you know depending on their age if they can start recognizing when their anxiety is increasing and they're going to do something mean to their to their younger um, sibling, um, then give them a plan. It's always nice to to, to help the, the person have a plan. Um, so you know, I know you love Charlie, and I know you you don't want to be mean, and I know it's part of your your difficulty. Um, so let's come up with a plan. What do you what do you think would work? Um, if you start feeling this way, could you? Could you go ride your bike? Could you go to your room and play, you know, video games? Um, so some some kind of plan because that that's that's hard. I mean, you can't you can't be. There are times that you, I mean, you just can't do it. You can't be hitting your your sibling. So what what can we do instead? And it, it, if they're being verbally mean, um, that's one thing. If they're being physically um, aggressive, you know that 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 is a whole nother kettle of fish and um you know that's just we, we really need to figure out that because you can't be doing it um so it may be a sensory thing i find a lot of people with disinhibition and with neurological disorders also have sensory issues and if they're hitting people it, it may be um a, a sensory thing so you might want to look into that kind of thing um if it's emotional then um, coming up with a plan might be helpful. I wish I could give you a book that on page 65 you could uh, get the answer to that question. Thanks, Kathy. Well, if you do, you'll be rich. So <laughs> thank you. I would be. <laughs> um, so the next question is their child has an FBA. Mm -hmm. um, there has been some talk about um, impulsivity. They're wondering if maybe it's disinhibition. Uh, the mm -hmm. child has ADHD and maybe possibly ASD, um, mm -hmm. but they sit under their desk at school um, and then sometimes they feel the need to um, touch their aid. So once they get going, they can't stop. So mm -hmm. they're wondering if you have any suggestions on how to kind of shift the dialogue with the school and uh, the behavior specialist to see if the issue is maybe more than just being impulsive um, mm -hmm. and helping them to decide what is the true issue. Right. Well, they've got a, if they've got a good functional behavioral assessment, then they should have data, they should have information about uh, when it occurs and when it doesn't occur. And um, if, if we can look at when it occurs and if we can make the environment where it occurs to be more like the environment where it doesn't occur. Um, so hiding under a desk, um, you know that would make me think that there's some kind of skills deficit that uh, um, the the kid really can't do something, and so rather than um, failing at it and and feeling miserable, where I'm going to get under the desk and not do it. Um, but touching the aid, you know, does it happen more at the end of the day? Um, is it is it something that uh, you know an OT could help with with uh, some kind of a, um, a sensory um rather than touching his aid he could he could um uh you know have a fidget or something or go for a walk or or do push-ups or um you know what 
the function, I'm, I'm hoping that the functional behavioral assessment actually gives you some data, gives you some information. And it's nice that there's a there's an FBA. And so you take the take all the information from the functional behavioral assessment and you develop a positive and proactive intervention plan from that information. And if you just say it's impulsive and um, you know that's not really looking at the um, what is the true um, uh, reason for this? What what's really the function of it? What's what's behind it? And um, you know I, I don't think we look hard enough when we have functional behavioral assessments. Take take that information and and really um, take the data and and look at why um, and and don't make assumptions. We 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 can't we really can't make assumptions when we're doing functional behavioral assessments. Um, so the assumption might be that it, it's just impulsive behavior. Um, and it might be, if he's got attention deficit, he probably does have impulsive behavior. Um, so can somebody work with him and develop a plan, um, you know, for him to do something different? Or like I said before, is it a sensory thing? Um, or do we really um, understand and, and is it disinhibition? Um, in which case, either if it's impulsivity or disinhibition, you're 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 still going to be better served by coming up with a positive and proactive uh, plan. Thank you, Kathy. There's actually several questions around. Um, are there any medications available, um, like um, like something with dopamine or anything like that? Do you have any suggestions? Um, I typically stay away from medicine because I'm not a doctor, um, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't know of any, I've never heard of any medicine that's specifically for disinhibition, but there's a lot of medicines for neurological disorders. And, and the more we can reduce anxiety, um, the, the more you're going to reduce the disinhibition and the difficult behaviors. Um, so I, I know a, a lot of times people are put on um, uh, like a serotonin type of inhibitor that can re can help reduce anxiety. Um, it, it, it seems like if we can reduce anxiety, that that's like that's like key. Um, or you know, is it uh, is it exercise? Is it uh, um, you know? I know it's hard now with COVID, but um, a, a lot of things that we suggest is uh, you know if a kid. Um, is in school and you start seeing their anxiety rising a little bit, then give them a, an empty envelope to bring to the office because um, movement can uh, change the chemistry in the, in the brain as well. But I, I, I don't really know of any specific medicine and I actually um, don't do any research in medicine because, you know, it's, it's, I'm not a doctor. Thanks, Kathy. Um, the next question is, are there some things that can be done when the child is swearing? And we understand that it's disinhibition, but if the child is swearing at the parent, you know, shouldn't they receive some form of punishment or how, how can one sibling be punished for it, but the other not? <laughs> yes. Um... First of all, the, the other sibling, because my, um, uh, my son is the youngest, and so my um, my other two kids, you know, told me quite frequently that I was a lousy parent and that I was uh, spoiling him. Um, you know, and, and I would fair is not equal, and equal is not fair. So um, you have to provide for each of your children um, in a way that's fair for that kid. And you know the other siblings might not might not uh, get it for a while, um, but if if they see that you're being being universally fair, and um, that you're being fair to that child for that child's um, specific needs, um, that can that can sometimes help the kid. And and sometimes I mean I, you know I, there were times I just said look you know when you get to be a parent then you can parent your kid the way you want to. I'm the parent, and so this is the way I'm parenting. Um, and you know, she would usually go stomping off and slam the door. But um, I forgot the first part of the question. Um, about um, it, 
the oh, child. swearing at the yeah, yeah. swearing at the parent. Yep. Yeah, and isn't there some? Uh, shouldn't there be some discipline? Um, you know, I thought so. Um, I I disciplined my son a lot, and it only made things worse. Um, back in the dark ages, when when uh, my my son was little, um, we were we were told that that we needed to be louder, and um, to be to be in control that um you know that we needed to punish we did we needed not to accept this type of behavior and so we tried that and one time i looked at my son and i thought wow he looks like a you know i'm yelling at him like crazy and he looks like a wild animal trapped in a corner fighting for his life and it, it was like a slap across my face because i thought you know this is this is really his disorder and again, I go back to not taking it personally. And it's hard. I mean, there was a time when um, if I asked my son a question, regardless of what question it was, would, would you like a dish of ice cream? Uh, Shut up, bitch. Uh, that was his initial reaction. And so I, I needed to, to get to a place of really understanding that it really was part of the disorder um, and do nothing. Uh, ignoring it as much as you can. Now, there comes a point, and there are certain things that, um, you know, are really, really unacceptable. Uh, so when he got to be about 12 or 13, I, I said to him, I said, okay, look, you know, you know how you swear at me? Um, the world is not gonna, gonna like that. I said, do, do you wanna get married? And I knew he did, um, yeah. Uh, do you wanna swear at your wife? No. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna come up with a plan. So whenever you swear at me, I mean you can you can swear you can go in your room, you can call me every name in the book, as long as you're not looking at me and swearing. If you look at me and you're swearing, then I'm gonna walk away. And he thought that was a great idea. You know that this will work. Okay, good. So he's doing his his homework one night and asked me a question and I said, gee, you know, I, I, I don't really know that. And he called me a bitch. And so I got up and started walking away. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, mom, I won't do that again. And I didn't respond to him. I just kept on walking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just didn't respond. And, and this is easier to do at home than in school. Um, because I just, it, the deal was I would walk away. And that, whereas some people would say it was punishment, it was really, I, I had talked to him enough so that he recognized that as a natural consequence. If you swear at people, they're not gonna wanna be around you. So if you swear at me, the natural consequence is I'm gonna walk away. And so I, I walked away and pretty soon he came traipsing after me, swearing at me, more than he had to start with and uh, I I went in my room and locked the door and turned my radio on as loud as I could so you know he would at least think I couldn't hear him um so it is part of the disorder it, it's really hard and I'm not perfect I I I'm not sure I should tell this or not <laughs> there were a time when it was um uh f you f you mom f you f you f you all day long f you it, it gets old you know and so he was getting ready for bed after a full day of f uing me and um he said it again and i said f you matthew and he was like in shock <laughs> he was like oh, you don't say that and uh but you know what we, we're not perfect so you can try really hard not to take it personally. You can really try hard not, you know, to try to ignore it or to walk away or to come up with a plan. Um, punishment, it's, I mean, you can, you can do the punishment. It's not gonna work and it's not gonna help. He's, he's not gonna be able to figure, figure it out by sitting in his room or, you know, taking all of his things away from him. So coming up with some kind of plan with him when he's calm, don't try to come up with a plan when, you know, he's in the middle of an emotional outburst. Um, but that, that is, 
mostly ignoring it, um, but then at some point trying to, to help figure out a different way. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I know we still have a lot of questions. Um, Kathy has another commitment at one o'clock, so I'm going to do two more questions for Kathy. Um, this one is, do you have any suggestions for explaining um, to an individual what, what might be going on with them while maintaining a positive sense of self? Um, I think it depends. It, 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 so much of this depends. And I, I think that would depend on the level of uh, intellectual understanding that the person has. And if the, if the person is calm, you know, I, I and it depends on what age too. Um, but you know, we're all different. We all got we all got things that aren't right. You know, none of us are perfect. And you know, if, if that person can can really accept that they're a good person, and I love to encourage positive um, positive uh, activities. Uh, so my, my son was a drummer, and no matter how many names he was calling me, he went for his drum lessons. Um, he had to have something that he felt good about. So if you can find something that the person does well, you know, draws or cooks or, um, you know, something that they can they can have um, a more positive self-esteem um, and then kind of talk to the person about, you know, I know you don't want to do this. Um, you know, how can how can I help you? But that's a hard one. They're all hard. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, this is a little bit of a follow-up to um, the student who went under the desk. Um, they're feeling like the FBA doesn't have much data, and they're mm -hmm. curious of, you know, if you have any suggestions on how they could approach the school to maybe collect some more. And they wanted to share that um, the student feels more comfortable being under their desk, um, and mm -hmm. they get their work done there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, depending on the age, um, I, I, the kid is probably going to reach an age where, um, you know, he's going to be embarrassed to go under the desk. Um, but at an early age, um, I've had schools, they, they have a special, you know, place where the kid can go and, and be in a contained area um, while they're doing their work. You know, there's no rhyme or reason why a kid has to sit at the desk to do the work although with COVID it's getting much more complicated um, but yeah the kid may feel safer under the desk um, the kid may um, have a sensory thing that he feels more comfortable in a, in a self-contained type of box or area um, so I don't you know Especially if, if the kid is young, I don't see any problem with them being under the desk, but it, it's really thinking outside the box. And, and if, the, if the child has Tourette, um, feel free to uh, contact me at the, the Tourette Association um, and uh, I, we could have a, a phone conversation and I could look at the functional behavioral assessment and see if I could be helpful. Great. Thank you, Kathy. I know this brings us to almost um, one o'clock and I know you have an engagement at one that you need to be on. And um, I wanted to share with everyone, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. One of our goals is to have Kathy back after the first of the year again. She's got great insight into challenging behaviors and disinhibition. So we were so honored to have you, Kathy, and we look forward to having you again. Do you have any um, last words? Um, no, not, you know, not really. Um, if, uh, if somebody wants to send me the questions, I could, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you're able to send out the answers to the whole group. Um, I, I've done that before when I've done these type of things. Yeah, we're able to do that. Um, actually, if you reply back, um, there will be um, to the webinar itself, the confirmation. I get that. Um, I can share with Kathy your questions um, and feel free if you want um, 
if you have more questions, you can go ahead and, and send that email and then um, we can follow up and I can send it to, out to all the attendees as well. Or if you feel that it's just personal and you just want a personal response, just let us okay. know. We'd be more than happy to do that for you. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Great. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to join us. And we look forward to having Kathy back. And thank you so much, Kathy, for being here. And everyone, have a great day. You're welcome, Laura. You have a good day, too. Hmm.